But what does God say about overindulgers? This is literally what was written on the paper. And under enjoyers, and then they cite that's Ecclesiastes, uh, the ECCL. Yes. And that, um, the simple answer, uh, Christ offers us in every age the same truth. We all need to deny our selfishness and to live abundantly for him. So that answers it. But I think what they're asking is, how do you interpret Ecclesiastes? So let's, let's start heading to Ecclesiastes. Okay, we'll have a sword drill, okay? Ecclesiastes 1, charge. And what you do is open to the middle of your Bible to Psalms, and then go to the right, Proverbs, and there it is, Ecclesiastes. It's a little 12 chapter book that has a lot of interesting elements in it. And by the way, this is the conclusion of Ecclesiastes. And that's why I said um, to this question, what does God say about overindulgers and underenjoyers? That's what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about. And God wrote the conclusion. And, and many of you have probably memorized it. Uh, let's hear the conclusion of the whole manner. Fear God and keep his commandments, for that's the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment. And that's, that is the same simple answer the Lord has always given. We all need to deny ourselves. We need to live abundantly for him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. And Micah 6, 8, uh, what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and walk humbly with thy God? God, and that concept is permeating the Bible. But um, let, let's look at this. And what we're looking at is the fact that no obscure verse in Ecclesiastes, and we're going to go through all those verses that they ask about, but no obscure verse. Now remember, most cults have found an obscure verse that they build their cult around. But no obscure verse in God's word ever will negate the rest of the clear and powerful passages. So if you're ever reading along and you read this and you go, oh no, what about this? Those are always congruent when you see God's plan. No little plucked out of its context verse in Ecclesiastes or anywhere else negates the rest it fits with them. So th that's important to always think about anytime you're studying the Bible. And God has already clearly said that he desires us to walk in the spirit. And so anything in Ecclesiastes is not countering that. Uh, also the Lord has clearly said, and Jesus over and over said in his earthly ministry, and by the way, um, every if some people say, they seem to think that the red letters, the, the, the words written in led, red letters are more impactful. In other words, what's written in red in your Bible? The words of Christ. But Peter tells us that it was the spirit of Christ that, that breathed out through every one of the Old Testament writers. So in other words, if you really want to know uh, what Christ said, the whole Bible should be in red. All of the Bible. It's not, Moses didn't think that up. Those aren't Moses' words. Those are God's words that he used the instrumentality of a servant Moses. So these, these words we're looking at in Ecclesiastes aren't Solomon's words. They were inspired, they're breathed out through the spirit of Christ, which was prophesying through them. So we know that the, the Bible is engineered so that no one part of it is, is detachable from the rest. It's all a, a wonderfully orchestrated message. So we're not supposed to live for the lust of flesh and the eyes and pride, and we're to take up our cross daily, but what does that have to do with Ecclesiastes? Well, uh, the Lord does say he has given us all things richly to enjoy. That's 1 Timothy uh, 6.17. And so, and he says we're supposed to live life more abundantly, and that's John 10. And so the same author that says all those things will balance it for us if we really take our time to walk through it. So, so it, it's not like one little verse pulled out negates everything else. This is the core of the Bible. And the author of both the Old and New Testament says, I've given you everything richly to enjoy. And I want you to live life, not just live it. I want you to live it 
overwhelming, overflowingly abundantly. So what is Ecclesiastes? And these are what the questioner, this is the first of the questions that, that you saw previously. What is Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 7, 8 through 17, and 18 through 20 teaching us from God? That's really, I think, what they were asking. And so, to answer that, what we have to say is, what's the big picture? Remember, you never just dive in and start dissecting one verse before, I mean, if in anything, I mean, uh, recently we were riding along and one of my children said, what's a marine biologist? And I said, well, bio is life, ologia means to study, and marine means something that lives in water, they study it, but I said, why do you ask? There's just a bigger picture here. Are you talking about salt water? Are you talking about fresh water? Are you talking about plants? Or are you talking about animals? I mean, you, you have to back up. So if you want to know what Ecclesiastes 5 is all about, you have to step back for a second and say, well, how did we get Ecclesiastes 5? Who is this author? Because the author of Scripture colors the message doesn't change the message. The scriptures, one of the, the most beautiful illustrations of inspiration is by a guy named Gauthien. He was a, a theologian who wrote uh, a beautiful treatise on inspiration. What he said is, the pure light of God shines through the stained glass windows of the 40 biblical authors. It never ceases being the pure light, but it takes the color of the author. What is the color that Solomon brings. That's the first thing. And then, what exactly is the structure, the message, the content of Ecclesiastes? So before you can uh, look at this and this and this, those pieces, you have to look at what are what what is the full 12 chapter treatise that you're pulling these out of, what is the, the type of literature? What is it saying? And then who, who wrote it? What coloring comes through? And, and all the way through. I mean, uh, you could do this for any book of the Bible. Uh, Luke writes in Greek that, that is parallel with the most marvelous writers of all history. Luke's Greek is unparalleled. Uh, Peter's Greek is just what he was. It's more like a, uh, a farmer blacksmith kind of talk that is very much a fisherman's type of talk. Paul should have been a lawyer. I mean, he reasons, ba-boom, 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 and that shows up. So the, the, the author colors, but then the structure of what we get. So who is Solomon? And just, just for a moment, I want you to... Um, uh, think with me, Solomon, more than any other person in history, had the world at his feet. Now think about why Ecclesiastes is written like it's written. It's written about contentment, it's written about material possessions, it's written about pleasure, and God is always in the background of those. What is going on? Well, if, if you think about Solomon, look at chapter one, and, and we're in the book of Ecclesiastes, and this is the simple uh, run-up to his message. Verse 16 it says, I have communed with my heart, saying, look, I have attained greatness, I have gained wisdom, and, and all, more than all before me in Jerusalem, my heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and on and on he goes. He was unsurpassed in his education and knowledge. God gave him, remember, his wish. And what do you wish for? He said, I want wisdom. And God made him unsurpassed. In, in his understanding. Secondly, he was unbridled in his ability and desire to pursue and find pleasure. Look what he says in chapter two, verse three. I searched uh, in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of man to do under heaven in all the days of their lives. In other words, he says, I have unlimited budget, I have unlimited power, I have unlimited ability to process. I'm gonna, I'm gonna explore everything. This is an amazing man. He was in the peak of worldly fame. You know that, that everybody sought audience with him in the ancient world. Because it, it says he was wiser than and names off all the, you know, Ethan the Ezraite and whoever, blah, 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 all these people known in the world. Solomon surpassed them all because God blessed him. And so he was worldly famous 
popular, prominent, and people uh, sought him out. And finally, he was possessor of uncountable wealth and possessions. In fact, I was adding up. Uh, If you look, if you ever even want to think about it, his father uh, in uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 22 gave to him, or I mean, maybe it's 2 Samuel. Now I'm going to have to look. Now you've got me. Uh, thinking about this, because it actually counts how much he gives his son. And uh, what, what he does is he gives him in the millions of ounces. Let me just see if I can find it, because I was reading it this afternoon. And it's, uh, let me try now, First Chronicles. I shouldn't quote something unless I've looked it up, but I read it. Here it is. It's, it's First Chronicles. It is. First Chronicles 22. And what it says in First Chronicles, you should always think what you thought first. It says that this is what Solomon, Solomon inherited. You talk about uncountable wealth. How would you like a dad that passes on to you 5,000 tons of gold? Tons. 5,000 tons. You know how many ounces that is? A hundred and 60 million ounces of gold. What what was gold spot? Friday close, 13 something? I don't know what it was, but it's 1,300 and some dollars an ounce. And he had 160 million ounces. Throw the three zeros on there and you've already gone beyond the wealth of anybody that's alive today. The only people that have that much money are in debt that much, like our government and, you know, others. And then you go 1.3. We're talking about 200 billion plus dollars. Nobody has that type of wealth today. That was the starting point for Solomon. And he just went beyond. And and that was just the gold. It also says in in, uh, 1 Chronicles 22, not only have I given uh, 5,000 tons of gold, I have given one million talents of silver. And that's 1.6 billion ounces of silver. Ounces. Spot silver, Friday, I looked it up, was 20 bucks an ounce. That's 32 billion more dollars in change. So he's got 200 billion in hard stuff and 30 billion and change. That's a quarter of a trillion dollars that was what his father had saved for the construction project. So he had uncountable wealth. Uh, We don't even know what, and we're not talking about paper. Nowadays, people have electronic wealth and paper wealth. This was hard. This was was actual. Okay. Um, Now, where does, where does this writing occurs. Some have said that that Solomon's three books flow from the periods of his life. The Song of Solomon was when he was a young man in love. And and, uh, that, you talk about that, is a a beautiful, in fact, internally in Song of Solomon, when you get to the eighth chapter, uh, it says the setting of the book. Solomon owned all these farms and everything, and nobody had Facebook back then or any Instagram or anything else. So really, people didn't know what he looked like. I mean, how far away, I mean, did most people stand from the king with with no photography available back then? So he went to one of his farms one day, dressed up like a farmer, and worked the fields. It was a vineyard, actually. And he worked across the vine from the prettiest girl in the vineyard. And he spent the summer harvesting, or the fall, or whenever they harvest, uh, with that young lady. And gradually, the whole book of Song of Solomon is him falling in love with this girl. And then he makes a promise, and she said, yes, she'll marry him. And when she gets all ready to marry him, he disappears. And she thought, oh, another one, you know. You know, made promises and fled. And a few days later, the trumpet sounds, and the owner of the vineyard shows up. And he's riding a chariot and he has these mighty men with him. And everybody says, it's the king, it's the king. And he pulls up and all the workers stand in front of the vineyard because there's, that's who they work for. And the king takes off his, his you know, uh, headdress or whatever he was wearing and he starts walking, looking. And as he walks down the workers, he can't help but smile. And he looks her in the eye and all of a sudden she goes, it's you. See, that's what Song of Solomon is about. And the whole thing is a portrait of Christ in the church and we see him and know him and love him. But that's his first book. His second book is from the wisdom of a mature man at his zenith and Proverbs just flows from all of that. But then 
Ecclesiastes is from an old and bitter man looking back on his wasted opportunities. And that's really the flavor you get. So to understand Ecclesiastes, you have to understand even not only who wrote it, but what was going on in his life and the stage and, and what he's doing. And so Solomon basically is writing from the fact that, that he's wasted his life. He was the richest man who ever lived. God blessed him with any, pro- yet you talk about a genie bottle. How would you like the God of the universe to say whatever you want, I'll give you. And he, he asked, well, he had personal visits. Not just once did God meet with him. He would offer these sacrifices and the Lord would appear and meet with him and he had all this blessing. He had the the blessing of the wisdom God gave him. He had his father's inheritance plus he expanded that. He he tried, uh, we already read that in chapter two of Ecclesiastes, the wine women and the palatial living. And you know what the, the setting is for Ecclesiastes? He's the proverbial womanizer of all. 700 wives, 300 concubines. And he never met a woman he didn't like and was always looking for one more. And nothing satisfied him. Uh, And the hands that start out at the beginning of his life as the wise, sacrificial son of David, the man after God's own heart, the man that the Bible writes about more than anything else, those hands that had been spread out to God in prayer, the rest of his life were pulled back instead. And it ends up... His hands are grasping the idols of paganism because these women he married draw his heart away from God. And even to this day, if you go to Jerusalem, there's a hill, it's called the Hill of Offense. It's still there from Solomon. And by the way, the United Nations building's on top of it. Isn't that fitting? I mean, the Hill of Offense where his pagan wives had all their temples to their idols. It's still in Jerusalem. Of course, the idols are all, you know, broken up and carried away because they were made of precious metals. But on that spot, still today, we remember the, the women who stole his heart. And his heart of zeal for the living and true God became cold and distant and empty. And and from that final era trickles out this spirit of God-inspired book that that we're wondering about, chapter 5. So, I mean, that changes everything. So, what is Ecclesiastes? Basically, after a life of pursuing things, Solomon confesses something. And look at at the end of the book, chapter 12. In fact... uh, I know some of you are always on the prowl for some good verses to memorize. Well, here, the the conclusion is, I remember I had to learn this uh, way back at Lake Lansing Baptist Church in Lansing, Michigan, when I was in high school youth group. It was part of what you had to learn to, to, to get a scholarship for camp. And, and this verse summarizes how, how parallel the scriptures are the Old and the New Testament. Because look what it says. After this entire 12 chapters, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole manner. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, everything we do in our life, all the wine, the women, and the palatial living, and everything else, Solomon says, is gonna be brought into judgment, including every secret thing. Like we looked at this morning, God's wrath is focused on even the secret sins. And he knew it. And by the way, remember what Jesus said? And and it, it is very much, Jesus knew Solomon. He knew him personally. In fact, he knew his thoughts. He knew his deeds. He knew everything. And you remember Jesus says, what does it profit? You all know that verse. Though you gain the whole world and you're the smartest and got the, every woman in the world and, and your father gives you $230 billion worth of hard assets, what does it profit you if you lose your own soul? So after a life of pursuit of things, Solomon confesses with Christ that one may well gain the whole world and still lose his own soul. He's talking about that. What he's saying is all that matters is God. And so... Only in the Lord is there any hope for this life. Solomon proves that. In fact, you could, you could all, always, almost title, Ecclesiastes is a funny name. In Hebrew, uh, Koheleth is what uh, it, it actually is called. It's the, the preacher or the, the one who declares. But, but actually, this would be a bestseller if it says, rich Jew. 
Uh, the richest Jew with all the women offers advice on finance and, and family, you know, or something like that. It would be a bestseller, you know. But actually, uh, Ecclesiastes, it kind of masks the message. But do you know what his message is? Only in the Lord is there any hope for this life. None of us in this room or on earth today could experience what he experienced. No one else will have the acuity of mind he had and the unlimited quarter of a trillion dollars to build and do and go and have whatever you want as much as you want. I mean, he ate. It says in the Bible that silver became like rocks, like stones on the ground. They just, they had so much silver, they just threw it on the ground. He only let gold touch him. He ate on gold. He sat on gold. I mean, nobody in the history of the world, not even the pharaohs were like that. In fact, some of the pharaohs used his money because they came up and stripped it all and took it all uh, away from his son. All the temple gold, you, everybody wonders, where did all the gold go? Where do you think it went? Shishak, the, the pharaoh, came and stripped everything and hauled it away uh, under Rehoboam, his son. We must meet the one shepherd. Look at chapter 12, verse 11. You talk about connecting the Bible. You talk about this being relevant to us. Solomon, under the inspiration of God, says, the words of the wise men are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. People say, whoa, wait a minute. When is God ever called a shepherd? Well, who was Solomon's dad? David. He said, the Lord is what? My shepherd, yeah, see? He grew up knowing that the Lord was his shepherd. And what he's saying right here is, in verse 11, he says, this, this, we have to get to know that one shepherd. And we know when that one shepherd walked the earth in John 10, 9 and 10, he says, I am come that you might have life. The, the thief, the devil, and his minions come to kill and steal and destroy, but I am come that you might have life. And not just barely eke out an existence, but have life that is more abundant. So Ecclesiastes is a phenomenal book. It's inspired by God. So the wisdom literature, all of it is from God. And we, we have to realize that this is just set uh, in the middle of, of five books. This, this is the, you know, this question takes us to the fourth of the five books. But Job, Job is all about Christ, our sure redeemer. I know that my redeemer lives. And, and he gives the truth about suffering. Psalms that, that Solomon's dad wrote, Christ is the shepherd that he talked about. Proverbs that Solomon wrote, Christ is the wisdom incarnate. And all the way through Proverbs, it talks about and points toward that one who was with God laying the foundation of the world in wisdom. It's a personification of wisdom. But now we get to Ecclesiastes. Christ is the only hope of contentment. And that gives the truth of God on life. Contentment, by the way, is not commanded, it's offered. We are offered contentment. We have to learn it. And then, of course, Song of Solomon, uh, God on Love. But that's the wisdom literature. If you remember a while back, this was a question. I just brought the chart back. We have the beautiful structure of the Bible that we studied that night. There are 17 books in a row before we get to the center of the Bible, which have these five wisdom books. And then it's followed by 17 more prophetic books. And all of the, the beautiful parallelism in the way that Ezra put the books of Ezra is the one that, that put the books in order that we have in our Bible today. But Job is a wisdom book about suffering and Psalms about worship and Proverbs about living and Song of Solomon about loving. But this fifth chapter is, is taken right out of the center of the Bible, giving us a theology, a framework from God about how to have a godly life. Ecclesiastes is a, a very important book to have a structure for how to process your job, your money, pleasures, recreation, where work fits, and how God overshadows all of those things. And that's why Ecclesiastes was written. It's, it's a very, very, very big and vital book. So Ecclesiastes is from God. God divinely inspired Solomon to record the truth of what it takes, look at this, to have contentment, contentment in life as a believer. 
Ecclesiastes was not written hanging out there. It was part of a master plan. See, God master planned the Bible. And he had Moses do part of it, and then he had Samuel and, and all of the, the, the priests, you know, record all those chronicles and stuff. And then he had David put in all that worship stuff and Job way back, and then he had Solomon fit in. And, and this, this book is about contentment. It's a philosophy of life. That's why a lot of people, Ecclesiastes is hard to read because it's philosophy. It's not fun. It's, it's provocative. A philosophy of life for us as Christians. The Lord has given us revelation. Now remember, Ecclesiastes is inspired. And inspired means it's revelation. It is God giving us something we wouldn't know if he hadn't given it to us. And it flawlessly comes to us without error, the very breath of God. To help us govern our temporal lives. See, we are here temporarily. Remember, Peter says we live in tents. And Paul talks about that. He says, my tent. Tents speak of temporality, our temporal lives on earth. He didn't leave us alone to kind of come up with our own plan. So Ecclesiastes is that plan. And we might distill the essential truths. If you read all 12 chapters to hit this fifth chapter, Solomon says, life apart from God, and there's a key word, a havel. It means vanity. That's the name of one of the two sons of Adam and Eve. It, that, that, that life is just, you know, Abel was, was just like a breath, like just a vapor. He, he lived a little while and his brother killed him and, and even that God designed. But uh, apart from God, life is vain and life with God, look at this, this is where some Christians are. Life with God can be vain if contentment is not practiced. Solomon was with God. Remember, if you've done the walk through the Bible stuff or the 100 steps, you know, that, that we're doing in Nepal, which parallels the walk through the Bible. Remember, Saul had no heart. David had whole heart. Solomon had what? Half heart. He was a believer. He was living with God, but his life was vain because he didn't learn what Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And I have learned, Paul said, in whatever state I am to be content. And if you don't learn that, life just is vanity, just chasing after the wind. The key word of this book is vanity. 37 times Ecclesiastes uses the word vanity. The key phrase is under the sun, 28 times. That's, that, that is, uh, it's only in this book. God inspired Solomon to use this, this concept that's only in this book. And it means, when, when you read the book, vanity is, is just you know, chasing after the wind and never getting something. You're always, it's elusive. And uh, under the sun means from an earth is all there is perspective. If you live under the sun, it means this is all there is. I'm just going to live for the moment. Kind of an Epicurean philosophy. So what you can learn, and in fact, that's I told you, it's philosophy of life, and some of you are thinking we'll never get to. You're right. We, I told Bonnie, I said, it took me all afternoon to type my notes on this question. I said, honey, if it took me all afternoon to type, it'll take me longer to say it. Remember, I only type with two fingers, but there are wrong philosophies. I mean, just, you can see this. If you look at Ecclesiastes 1, starting in verse 4, you have one of the most beautiful illustrations of some wrong philosophies. Without the addition of God, humanism is great. That means you're glorious, so exalt yourself. And that's what Solomon does. And life is a constant promotion of human dignity, personal worth, inherent value, totally apart from the Lord. That's what humanism is. And mankind is in charge, and by study and hard work, we continually better ourselves. We're evolutionary. And we're just going to get better and better. And boy, wait till next Sunday, if the Lord tarries. When we look at the fact that God does not intervene in the earth directly with a zap, until the sixth seal of Revelation, humanity is able to destroy itself. Just left to ourself. And, and we'll cover that next week, and we're, we're doing a good job right now. Uh, Epicureanism starts in chapter two. Look what, what we've already read, but look what Solomon says. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth, I will enjoy pleasure. But this was vanity. 
and he, he searches how to gratify, verse three is, this is the Epicurean, remember Paul saw the Stoics? They're kind of like the Puritans. And the Epicureans, they're like Californians, you know? I, I can say that, because I'm from California. I, I live there, we had children there. Did you know California is like a cereal box? When you take out the fruit and the nuts, the fruits and the nuts, all you have left are the flakes, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and there are a lot of Epicurean philosophies in California. And life is a party and go for it. And this makes life a chase for satisfying lust. And by the way, lust is reptilian. That means the longer you feed it, the bigger it gets and it's impossible to satisfy it because there's a diminishing return on every feeding so you feed your lust you feed your lust you feed your lust did you did you read you want to read something sobering read the testimony of this guy that just got convicted in a thousand years prison sentence in cleveland the one that in that chained up and incarcerated three women and raped them for a decade read what he said he said his life was ruined by pornography because what excited him here, it took this much to excite him, it took this much to excite him. Finally, he couldn't be excited, so he had to enslave three children and keep them for a decade. That's Epicureanism at its hilt. Life is a party, go for it, and you chase trying to satisfy lust, and it's impossible. You can never satisfy lust. It is, it is, well, Solomon said it. The eyes of humans are never satisfied. You, you think that you want to be satisfied with art? You'll never have enough. J, I mean, uh, William Randolph Hearst. The, remember the guy, Patty Hearst, what, father or grandfather, the richest man at one point in America, was an art addict. And he bought all the art of Europe and he kept sending people out to buy it and they would find that he already had it because he was never satisfied. He already had the art and Epicureanism, which this book, and materialism. I mean, starting in verse 12, then I turn myself to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. And, and what he starts talking about is, he talks about the fact that, that no matter what, he went for all he could get, whether it was you know having all the books, or remember he says of the reading of books, there's no end. Worth is based on things and possessions and accomplishments and degrees and everything else, and that never satisfies. And then he, then he talks about in chapter three, fatalism. Life is rigged, so resign yourself to live passively, and it produces despair and resignation and cynicism. I mean, look at how Nietzsche and others ended their lives, you know, with syphilis and blind. And, and they were the, the great, you know, uh, fatalistic philosophers. And then Solomon goes on and says, he talks about the fact that was God even involved? And deism says God is busy. He's with other things. Go it alone. And so you get detached and you get lonely and get in despair. I mean, that's why a lot of people don't like Ecclesiastes. It's kind of sad. And then mere religion. You live by man's rules and man wisdom instead of God's word. And this life has, as Paul says, a form of godliness, but it denies the power. And then Ecclesiastes studies wealth. And that's now we've gotten right here, and right here, see you knew I was going somewhere, that's the question. And, and you understand that he's, he's gone from God in one through eight to wealth in nine onward, which we're gonna look at, and, and what Solomon finds is that if you're living for wealth, it's just an endless chasing after stuff and status and pleasures, chasing, and you never get them. I mean, when you get them, it's not what you wanted. You want another one or a different one or a bigger one or more of one or whatever. And then, finally, the book ends with a, a study of morality. Try your best, do as much good as possible, which is what moralists say. And this is powerless in the presence of ever-growing wickedness. See, Solomon found his heart was getting more and more wicked. The, the darkening by the pagan, I mean, his wives were worshiping idols that needed human sacrifices. And, and he is declining in the darkness, like Con, Joseph Conrad said, oh, the heart of darkness. And that's what he's feeling. His morality was, was not able because it, morality is powerless in the presence of ever-growing wickedness. And that's the problem America has right now. Ever-growing wickedness. We've removed Anything that can stop 
the wickedness. I'm talking about our nation, not us. And uh, we're, we're reaping it. That's, it's not gun control, it's heart control we need in this country. Bad hearts use guns badly. Good hearts don't. But we don't want to deal with the heart. We just want to deal with controlling stuff. So what now? We have eight minutes. What is Ecclesiastes 5 about? And I'm glad whoever asked, I've forgotten now who asked the question. Uh, the first, look, look at the beginning of chapter 5, and, and I'm not going to go through this except what he's talking about here is summarized in verse 2. Do not be rash with your mouth, and, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God, because God is in heaven and you're on earth, therefore let your words be few. What he said is, the first part is, be honest to God. Realize, God, here's what you say. Don't rashly talk and make vows and promises because even if the people around you forget, God never does. In fact, I had a great talk with uh, uh, one of our teenagers this morning uh, walking across the fellowship center. I says, how you doing? And, and this person said, well, I'm not getting to my Bible reading because I'm so busy with other, my games and my computer and television. And I said, do you want any advice? He said, I would love some advice. I said, here's the advice. Make a sacred vow. God hears it and say that I won't start my games and my television, my internet and my poking and whatever pinning and everything else until I make room for you. And it was amazing. He said, he hears that? I said, mm-hmm. And he'll give you the strength to keep your, your vow to him that he's first. Now, this is what we're going to look at. Be honest to others, and now be honest to yourself. And so, let's, let's get into this. Nine lessons about wealth from Ecclesiastes 5, okay? Look at verse 10. And this is, I'm glad they asked the question. In fact, I had this written in my Bible. I actually, uh, I, I look at this, and I know that, that I heard this in a sermon somewhere. Because I write in my Bible, and I do go to church myself, um, you know, when I'm not here. And, and uh, this is kind of a combination of things that I have heard over the years preached on, but look what it says. Verse 10, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is vanity. Whoever loves money never has enough money. That's John D. Rockefeller's mantra. Remember, he said, all I want is one more dollar. All Solomon wants is one more wife. Whoever loves possessions, it, it's not just money. Money is distilled time. Uh, it, it, money it gives us the opportunity to look for happiness because we don't have to work. See, back then you had to work to eat. If you had money, you didn't have to work until the money ran out. So you could look for something. Whoever has the, the opportunity to look for something never has enough of what they're looking for. The more you have, the more you want. It's the first lesson. God wrote this. And God says, the more you have, the more you want. It's an endless, vicious cycle. We're, I mean, when we're, when a teenager, you dream of this. When you get there and have it, you dream of that. When you're there, you dream of this. And it's just like endless until you're too sick and, and you, you can't have anymore and you're getting weak. But it's just, I'm talking about human nature. The more we have, the more we want. Now, look at the, the other half of verse 10. He who loves abundance is never satisfied with increase. Whoever loves wealth or abundance is never satisfied with his income. The more you have, look at this, the less you're satisfied. God is saying, be careful. These are laws built into the universe where we live. And the first law is, the more you pile up, the more you're going to want to pile up. And then the more you have piled up, the less your pile satisfies you. David was literally the wealthiest man that's ever lived, ever. With, he's the one that gave the million talents of silver and 100,000 talents of gold to his son. Solomon, the bulk of his estate was given to him. David, who had everything. David never lost a battle. David was never even wounded in battle. David's name, he's a one-named person, his first name, and he's known around the world two, 3,000 years after he'd lived. He's unbelievable. Yet he didn't have enough. He had to walk up to the edge of his, his uh, balcony, and he had to look around and look for someone else. Bathsheba, a young, young girl. 
The more you have, the less you're satisfied. Solomon knew that from his own dad and his own life. Now, now look at verse 11, what it says. When goods increase, they increase who, who eat them. Uh, consumers increase. The more you have, the more people, including the government, will come after. I was just sitting at a conference. Remember I told you I was with the Christian Medical and Dental, and I was sitting talking to doctors. And I said, what is one of the things they struggle with? You struggle with as a doctor. And they says, everybody that sees me wants something. They want my money. They think I'm rich. They don't realize all the government regulations and Medicare downsizing and sequestration is lowering my income and all my staff is bleeding me because I don't get as much in and I've got to pay out. And they, but this doctor said, it seems like I'm on everybody's list. Well, you know what? The more goods you have, the more wealth, the consumers increase. And the more you have, the more people will come after it. Whether it's, you know, you gotta carry a million dollar umbrella of uh, liability insurance or 10 million because the more you have, the more people will want it. And verse 11 continues, and what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The more you have, the more you realize it does you no good. You gotta protect it all. You gotta put your treasures behind cases with, with burglar alarms. I mean, everybody has a burglar alarm, don't they? You have to have one in your car, you have to have one in your house and you've got a higher security in live in gated communities because what benefit is all the stuff because you can only look at it from a distance because it does you no good because everybody wants it and it, this i mean this should be a bible study on manhattan for those people that are rushing around with their flash trading making a million dollars some of them a day and they're so unhappy and their wives are divorcing and that's what all the TV series are about. The more you have, the more everyone will come after it and the more you can just look at it. You can't even use it. They have all the gizmos, but they don't even have time to enjoy them. And now it's one minute, it's time to go and we'll pick up there. Look at verse 12. This is so pretty. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. I was, walking, I was watching um, or reading a little piece on Bloomberg about how the restauranteurs of Manhattan have to labor to give something new to those ultra, the uber wealthy. And, and you know, they're, they're stuffing cockroaches with hummingbird tongues because they, I mean, no, no, people, people eat bugs. And, and they, they have to be exotic. It has to be something no one else has ever seen or heard of. And it has to co cost a lot. But look, the ability to eat hummingbird tongues stuffed in, you know, whatever's permits him no sleep. But the, the poor laborer that works up here in Goebbels or wherever doing the vineyards is so tired after he works all day long as an undocumented laborer and gets just enough money to buy food on the way home in the old car that barely runs and his little family packed in a room and all eight or 10 of them are in there and they eat it all, boy does he sleep with no little pills, right? See, God says wealth is to test our hearts and to see if we're gonna get our wanter under control if we're gonna find real satisfaction from him, only Christ can satisfy us. Whether we can find that, did you know John D. Rockefeller, the first billionaire in, in history, couldn't, he was sick. He had, uh, you know, some type of like anorexia nervosa, kind of a, he, he, he was shriveling up until he started giving his money away at age 53. They thought he was gonna die at 53. And someone wisely counseled him, start giving your billions away. And he lived to 98. And the Rockefeller Foundation is still going on. So let's all stand. It's 716. Oh, we went over time. See, the more time you have, the more you want. Uh, <laughs> it even happens in church. But um, we'll have to pick up there next time because did you know it actually even gets better than this? And so, and you ought to see the other questions uh, that are coming after this one. I just saw someone said, can you summarize in only one night, Second Peter? And I thought that would be a challenge uh, and, and et cetera. But here are the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God 
and do what he says. That's our whole duty. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, we started uh, last time, and I'm just going to pick up, especially for anybody that missed it, uh, the simple answer. I mean, if, if we were trying to get through uh, everything, I would just answer this way, that the simple answer is Christ offers in every age the same truth. We all need to de- deny our selfishness and live abundantly for him. So we aren't supposed to overindulge and we're not supposed to underenjoy. In fact, of all people on the earth, we're supposed to be living life most abundantly. And uh, escapades. That's what you said about me this morning. Escapades. Well, I'll tell you another escapade. Uh, I did an escapade once delivering Bibles in Albania uh, or around Albania and I got caught by the army and imprisoned. It was very fun. Uh, But um, a different escapade was I was with my wonderful wife, Bonnie, and we were thinking we would never travel again the rest of our life because we were expecting um, our second child. And so I took her on a trip to Europe uh, a shoestring trip to Europe. The idea was we'd sleep on the trains and she was about eight months along. I was the only one that slept on the train, uh, you know, because she couldn't find a comfortable spot. But we we did save up our money and one night we stayed somewhere and um, it was at Neunschwanstein, if you've ever heard of it, in Garmisch in southern uh, Germany. It's the castle that uh, Disney World has got in the center. The model of the castle where we were staying at is in the center of all the Disney properties. It's really pretty. And we were staying there and we were alone. There was nobody else there. Uh, It was February and freezing cold and wet and damp. And and so I thought, wow, we're going to have fun. So we sat at this restaurant for two and a half to three hours eating. And, And we were as normal. Uh, we just were sitting there eating and reading and discussing the Bible. And at the end of two and a half hours, the couple we didn't see around the corner came to our table. And they said, we've watched you for two and a half hours and we have one question. Why are you so tranquil? Did you know we're supposed to be the ones enjoying life that the world sees tranquility, uh, the, the reality of Christ. So we went to Ecclesiastes uh, and we looked at who wrote Ecclesiastes and then we looked at uh, what's the context and I'm not going to repeat all this and we got to right there and then we started jumping into the fifth chapter uh, and we learned this, uh, whoever loves money, it's not has money, so the, the predicator is whoever loves money, uh, never has enough and that means the more you have, the more you want. If you love wealth, you're never satisfied with your income. It's kind of the one more dollar syndrome. And so that means the more you have, the less you're satisfied. And Christ came to satisfy us. And, and we are to be living uh, the life that, that the unsatisfied um, emptiness of the world longs to know about what we have. And as goods increase, the Bible says, so do those who consume them. And so that's the more you have, the more people, including the government, are going to come after it. And and what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on? You get to the point where you have so much you can't even enjoy it because you've got to protect it and guard it and you're working all the time, you can't even use it. And then finally, we ended last time with um, the labor of the... Uh, the sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich man doesn't even let him sleep. And I ended with uh, a commentary on, you know, just good old hard work and how uh, people that are poor and work hard drop into bed and fall asleep. And those who are rich and have everything can't sleep because either they're eating too exotic food or they're worried, you know, about the markets going 24 hours and they're not able to uh, keep up with it. And so, The lesson is the more you have, the more you have to worry about. So uh, let's continue in, uh, doesn't like me tonight. There we go. Let's continue. Look at verse 13. And if you're in Ecclesiastes 5, I actually have these written in my Bible. I actually heard this as a sermon once. And and I'm not sure what the sermon said, but I know what I wrote in my Bible. And that's what I wrote up here. And uh, if you look at at verse 13, uh, there is a severe evil. Ecclesiastes 5.13, which I've seen under the sun. Riches kept for their owners to his hurt. And uh, basically the idea is the more you have, the more you can hurt yourself by holding on to it. Now we're going to go in a moment to the New Testament parallel passage, which the Apostle Paul, uh, remember the Bible that Paul read and studied and had his devotions out of was the Old Testament. 
So the, the biblical writers, Christ himself and, and the apostles, knew the Old Testament very well. And, and therefore, you see a lot of reflections of this. In fact, Paul says about this one, he says, uh, those that want to be rich pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And the idea is that, that our wealth can become like a sharp, piercing object to us if we're holding too tightly to it. And, and he said, a severe evil I've seen, rich is kept for their owner to his hurt. And so the more you have, uh, uh, the more you can hurt yourself by holding on to it. In other words, wealth is not, the, the purpose of wealth that the Bible presents is that, that God is the owner, we are a steward, and as he gives us wealth, he's looking to see whether or not we're holding it, thinking we're the owner. It's a test of, of, of our understanding of our role as stewards, that, that all that I have comes from you. Uh, for all I have belongs to you. Nothing I own, nothing I possess is by my own hands. It's by your faithfulness. I'm quoting a hymn. So please take this offering from a heart of thanksgiving for you've given all I have. The heart of a believer is one who says that all I have belongs to you. I'm a steward. It's just like children. Children are a gift from the Lord. I didn't pick them. God sent them. They didn't pick me. God sent them. And we are stewards, raising children on behalf of God in his place, in this world. They don't belong to us. They belong to him. Money is the same. And, and we have to realize that. And so our wealth, uh, verse 14 says, or wealth lost through some misfortune. Uh, the more you have, the more you have to lose. I don't know if you noticed, David, the U.S. Um, uh, Federal Reserve Bank, you know, what's on all of our money? that's actually a privately held corporation, they are buying government bonds and bonds have switched in their uh, interest rate and so the value of them is decreasing and the US Federal Reserve has lost $192 billion in the last few weeks. That's a lot of money. They lost it faster than America's losing money, you know, or faster than we're going in debt. The more you have, the more you have to lose. The Federal Reserve only has $32 billion in capital left. If they keep losing at this rate, not only is the U.S. government going broke, the Federal Reserve, which prints the money, is going to go broke. But the, the, what the Lord is saying is we can, the more we have, the more we can lose. And it's just a principle of wealth we need to think about. And here's another one. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. And I always say... Uh, a little picture that's just in my mind. Bonnie and I were driving across the country headed to speak at Word of Life back in the old days when we used to drive this motorhome with all the kids in the back. And, you know, I, I just drove for thousands of miles and I just had nothing to do but look out. I mean, that was before, you know, smartphones and everything. And so you just didn't do anything but think, you know. And I was driving along and I says, hey, honey, quick, look out the window. And it was the most amazing thing. There was a little house. You could tell some older person lived there. Everything about it was old. Everything. It just looked old. An old car, old furniture that looked like it was from the 20s, you know, the, the old metal kind that, that used to just be one piece metal that moved and rusted and everything. And it was just there. But what I saw just glancing is I could tell the people died because the kids were hauling everything out of the house and they had three piles. And you could tell what it was. They were wrapping some things in, in U-Haul blankets those were the treasures. I mean, that was the furniture that was probably worth something. They were wrapping it up and you could see them carrying it out and putting it in this little tiny trailer. Then by the road where the motorhome passed, there was this mound. I mean, you could tell these people were depression era people. I mean, they saved every milk carton, bales of newspapers. I mean, everything made of aluminum foil. They just, and it was just, that was the trash pile. And then the yard was filled with what? Tables. It was the yard sale. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb. As he comes, so shall he depart. No U-Hauls go behind hearses. I've done 300 funerals. Nobody has taken anything with them so far that I've noticed. You have to either send it ahead or it goes in the trash, the yard sale, or your kids wrap it up and put it in a U-Haul and do something special with it. You don't take it with you. And see, the, the wealthiest man of all time Solomon 
said, I was born with nothing, and I'm departing and not taking anything with me. That's, that's what a steward, it's what we do with what we were entrusted with that matters forever. It's not how much is on our trash, yard sale, and treasure pile after we die. It's too late then. It's what did we do with it while we were operating and designating. And finally, uh, the other half of the verse says, he takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. The more you have, the more you can send ahead to heaven. Now see, that's what we don't realize. That, that Christ offers, I mean the US government, or I mean the Federal Reserve right now is experiencing negative, the effects of the bond values going the wrong direction. Did you know God offers 10,000% interest? I remember when I was 13 years old, our church was having a bond sale. And I had a coffee can where I put everything that I earned. I don't know why I didn't put it in the bank. I had it in a coffee can though. I guess, I don't know why. Maybe I didn't know how to go to the bank, but I had it in my coffee can. And I remember they said, we want you to buy a bond. And I asked my parents, should I buy it? And they said, yeah, they're paying 13% interest. Any of you alive back then? Do you remember 13% under... Carter or whenever it was. I don't remember when it was, but 13%. Every dollar you get 13 cents. Your money doubles every seven years or less, six years. Whoa, who wouldn't want church bonds at that? God offers 10,000%, a hundredfold. That means for every seed you put in, you get a hundred in return. It's unbelievable return. And what Solomon was saying is, you take nothing from your labor you can carry in your hand, but God adds in the New Testament, which you can send it ahead. And that's, that's really the, the ultimate lesson. Well, now let's go to Matthew 6, because um, let's see how Jesus applies this. Uh, that's Ecclesiastes, and a lot of people, there's a lot of disputes about Ecclesiastes anyway. Um, uh, if you read old study Bibles, they say that it's just the bitter words of an you know, uh, empty words of an empty person or whatever. But of course, I don't believe that. I don't think you do either. It's an inspired book. Jesus considered it scripture. Jesus called Ecclesiastes scripture. So what does Jesus think? And so look at Matthew 6. And these are the, the very, 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 in fact, I printed them out for you. Um, but you should look at them in your Bible so that, that you make sure that they're highlighted. But basically, these are the principles that Jesus, who happens to be the owner, who's entrusted us with our life and any treasure we ever have in this life. This is what he says, don't, and uh, this is not a basketball term, layup, it's actually, uh, uh, see I do know sports, some of you think I don't know anything about sports, but uh, uh, thesarizo is the word. You might recognize thesarizo sounds like thesaurus. It's the same idea. It's the idea of, of piling up. In fact, it's used for uh, stacks of coins. If you can think of a money changer uh, that's sitting at a table exchanging money, he would have stacks of all different denominations of coins in the old days. So what Jesus is saying, don't stack up for yourself. So he's specifically talking about wealth, earthly wealth, but the key is this. Don't make stacks in your mind or in your plans or anything else and say, this is mine, because it's not. Not if you're bought at a price. Not if you're a slave of Christ. Slaves didn't possess anything. Their master owned everything, including them. We are slaves. We are bond slaves of Christ. So when he purchased us, anything attached to us belongs to him. Now most attached to us is, you know, sinful and he washed it away. But any possessions attached to us are no longer our own. And so what the Lord is saying is, don't, once I purchase you, don't believe that anything you had in the past or anything that comes in the future is for you to stack up for merely self as the questions start out, overindulgers, just living for myself, kind of the, the rich man uh, that built his barns too big that says, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, let's just have a good time. That whole idea, Jesus said, is wrong. Don't do that. 
because moths will get it, rust will get it and destroy it. Thieves will be after it and steal it. But, see, Jesus, remember in Matthew 6, he's already started out by saying that there are two doors or gates. Uh, there are two roads that... Uh, extend from them and now he's talking about two treasuries everything is jesus is a master communicator and uh treasuries uh jesus always is the contrast he's always saying there is a straight and narrow way and there's a broad way and there's a wide gate and there's a narrow gate everything with him was a clear-cut choice here's the same thing Two treasuries. You can have an earthly treasury. You can spend your life and I can spend my life just never quite having enough. Always needing to, to work a little longer, get a little bit more because you never know how much medical is going to go up and we got to have enough so that we can never have a care in the world when actually the Lord says that his grace is sufficient and most powerful in our times of weakness. See, independence, especially financial independence, I mean, we think that's biblical. That's more American than biblical. Financial independence isn't really a biblical principle. Dependence is. And the Lord says, if you are finding your independence from care, your independence from anxiety, by having this huge earthly treasury, watch out, because moths and rust and thieves are going to get it. And not only that, but I'm going to have to pry it out of your hands by death. That's not the wisest way to do it. But, verse 20, and it's the same term, thesarizo. So actually, this is a good word. Piling is good. If you pile for your account in heaven, you see that? It's the Lord actually has opened, you know, a 403B or a 401K. It's actually a 10,000 H, you know, 10,000% in heaven. He has opened accounts for us in heaven, and we accrue interest. Take, for example, just Jillian's night, so I'll talk about her. Did you know that if you invest in a young lady, or a young man, or a young couple, or anybody, you know, the boss last week, whoever it is, if you invest in their ministry, then everything that they accomplish for the Lord, the Lord adds it to your account in heaven. You are a partaker in what they do. And that's the way you deploy your treasures into heaven. You still hold them, but you're a steward of them. And you say, Lord, instead of saying, um, this is all mine, see, it's all yours, how much do you want me to live on? How much do you want me to have to take care of? And we're going to get to that. It's very interesting um, when you get to uh, Ecclesiastes, what Ecclesiastes says is the, and we're going to get into the whole savings thing, but we are to be stewards of these treasures and, and laying them up in heaven. And the only way that you get them to heaven is you have to deploy them while you're on earth. Uh, it's very interesting how um, we think that we're supposed to hold everything to the very last minute. And uh, the Lord says, no, Right now, lay up your treasures in heaven. Surrender it all to me. Because there are no moths in heaven, there's no rust in heaven, and thieves can't get into heaven because outside are all the sinners and they're never going to be allowed in. But look at the byproduct, what it does for us in verse 21. It starts giving us an anchor. Now, it's very interesting. In the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews talks about our souls being anchored in heaven and that, that the anchor is cast in heaven. Now, of course, we know that it's Christ and he's, he's in heaven and he's, he is the one who's gone before us. But he said that, that another element is this idea of wherever our treasures, that's where our hearts. I mean, if, if you know uh, that someone is near something valuable to you, and if it's really valuable to you, you're watching them because it means a lot to you and you don't want them to harm, you know, your car or your child or, or whatever because we connect to whatever our treasure is. Now, here's another one of the twos. Look at this. There are two doors, there are two roads, there are two treasuries, but look at this. Our wealth 
determines who our real master is. If, if our master is the Lord, our treasures are in heaven, our treasury is his control, and he's our master. Because either we'll hate the one and love the other, or we'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. And yet in America, there are a lot of people that are, their idol is not Buddha or Ashtaroth or Baal, it's money and security and success and and. And they lust after comfort and convenience and security. And those are the three dangers of the culture we live in. We, we lust for comfort, we long for security, and convenience is prime. Did you know, if it rains, church attendance goes down. Why? It's, it's not convenient to go out in the rain. Yet I can remember in my escapades, going to churches where people walked three to four hours, whatever the weather, and there were holes in the ceiling because we met in barns, in outdoor buildings. And during the services, when it would start precipitating, whether it was snow or rain, all they did is break out, you know, tarps or blankets, and they would sit on backless benches, kind of like in a locker room. They, that's what the seating was like, wooden benches and they would have blankets and tarps on their heads going down the rows as it rained. Now you see that in football games, you see that in soccer games. You go to our soccer fields, whichever direction it is, um, I guess it's that way, on a rainy day when the attendance is down in church and it's packed, they're out there, under their umbrellas, they wouldn't miss it. It's interesting to think about how, how we are so easily seduced away from our master. Uh, but seek first, and this, this is the bottom line. Seek first God to rule over everything, over our treasures, over our lives, over everything that we have. So let's see if this will work now. Here we go. So let's, let's look at, at some applications of this. Now, here is a great book if you've never read it. Randy Elkhorn, he really believes what he writes because he lost everything because of abortion protesting. He's, he's a pastor of a church out in uh, the Northwest, or was, I don't know where he is now. But Randy Elkhorn was a pastor and he believed that abortion is murder, as I do, only he laid down in front of the cars, in front of the clinic, so that nobody could come in to have their abortion. And they arrested him, and under the federal racketeering laws, they invoked for abortion. Pro I mean, you can kill someone and get out of jail in, you know, six months, but boy, you lay in front of an abortion clinic, and we're going to put racketeering charges and federal charges against you. And they did. And they took everything he owned. House, savings, that's what racketeering charges do. And he said, great, take it all. And he dedicated all of his books uh, to a Christian foundation, and he's a best-selling author. And now he works, he used to work for $6 an hour as a kind of a janitor at the church. He still preaches, but he's the janitor. I think that's great. It's a great idea, a very humble way to do it. And he writes books now. And the government can't take anything because they can't take, if you live in poverty, there's nothing to take. You can't take uh, blood out of turnips, you know. But look what he writes. He's real serious about this. He wrote this. He who lays up treasures on earth, that's what we just saw in Matthew 6, 19, spends his life backing away from his treasures. To that person, death is loss. Now, just sit for a minute and think. Tonight, if you were facing death in the morning, would it just be loss? Like, oh, I'm losing everything. It's going to all be over. That's because primarily everything that's precious to you is here. He spends his life moving away from his treasures and he has reason to despair. If everything that's precious and valuable is, is all that stuff we're guarding and hoarding and trying to earn more of and get more of and enjoy more of, then we're backing away from uh, all through life uh, our treasures. But he who lays up treasures in heaven, that's the other treasury in Matthew 6.20, looks forward to eternity. He's moving daily toward his treasures. To him, death is gain. Why did Paul say, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? That's because his treasures were in heaven. And, and he said, I counted everything but loss for Christ. It doesn't mean he got rid of everything. Paul doesn't look like he got rid of everything. He's traveling all over the place and he's got books and parchments and clothes here and there. But the ownership of it 
was totally surrendered. It no longer belonged to him, it belonged to the Lord. And he spends his life moving toward his treasure and has reasons to rejoice. Here's another thing Alcorn said, is the passing of time causing you and me to despair or rejoice? The older we get, the closer we get to our lives being over, to being 79.6 if you're a woman and 78.2 if you're a man. That's the average life. So if you're getting close to these two numbers, is it causing despair or rejoicing? God's kingdom is to be our reference point. We need to see all else in light of the kingdom. We should be compelled to live as we do, not because we treasure no things, but because we treasure the right things. We treasure what God says is going to last forever, and it's all connected to him. And last thing that Alcorn says, you can tell I really like him. It's a great book. That Treasure Principle is one of those little, they're only this big books, and uh, it's just fabulous. But we often miss something in missionary martyr Jim Elliott's famous words. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. We focus on his willingness to go to the mission field. That willingness started when he relinquished his hold on things as being mine. If you read the the journals of Jim Elliot that Elizabeth Elliot, his wife, uh, wrote uh, after his martyrdom, he came to a point where he said, nothing is mine. My possessions, my career, my future, my plans, anything, even my life is not mine. It's the Lord's. Okay, now, I told you we'd parallel this, so let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I want to walk through with you real quick uh, Paul's take on this. Now, remember, Paul was reading this all through his life, reading the Old Testament. And so he actually, in in 1 Timothy 6, is writing to Timothy. Timothy is a pastor, and he's writing to him and giving to him the principles for his own life and for him to teach in the church at Ephesus. And look at chapter 6, verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Doesn't that sound like what we just read in Ecclesiastes 5? You can see the reverberation. And here's the lesson. Always remember, things are only temporary. Things are temporary. People last forever. That's why people are never an interruption. Things are interruptions. You know, your lawnmower stops working or your blender stops working or your car stops working. That's an interruption. But people are never an interruption because things are temporary. People last forever. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain, Paul says, we can take nothing out. Number two, uh, look at verse eight. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Isn't it interesting? Food and clothing, food, just enough. I mean, back then you couldn't store. I mean, they didn't know about Y2K back then and, you know, having enough food for a lifetime. You know, get C rations and MREs and everything else. They just lived pretty close to, to the cycles of life. And covering, you know, so you don't freeze to death. So enough to eat to go on living and clothing, that is enough to be content. Did you know we have been trained in discontent? Uh, better homes and better gardens. That means mine's better than yours, and I want mine to be better than yours. And that's what we've been schooled in in America. It's discontent. My teeth are not white enough. My skin is not nice enough. You know, my hair, I don't even worry about that. You know what I mean? We just, we are schooled in discontent. And we want, you know, better toothpaste and better shampoo and better cars and better electronics. But you know what the lesson the Lord said is? Only seek necessities. Food and clothing are necessities. Wait for the rest. Do you remember when people used to wait until they could afford something to buy it? Have you ever thought that that could be part of the Lord's will? This idea of going into endless cycles of debt. Uh, I mean, look, we have a trillion in student loans, a trillion dollars in student loans. And then when they graduate with their student loan degree, they can't even get a job to pay back the student loan. They would have been further ahead to learn a skill and just be a normal person with a skill then have a degree and a trillion dollars of debt and no job. And I'm just talking about, I'm not talking about any individual, I'm talking about where our whole culture's gone, that no one has thought through the ramifications. 
that God says, seek necessities. I mean, you go out and shop until you have enough food to eat, enough clothes to wear, but wait for the rest. The furniture, the new car, the latest electronics, the comforts, the conveniences, everything else. That's biblical. It's American to just buy it, you know, and mortgage uh, the farm to get what you want now because we're not willing to wait. And, And look what Paul told Timothy. And by the way, these principles have been universal in the church until modern times. That's why every time there's a great missionary movement in the 18th century, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, people just went. Did you know they can't go anymore? They have student loans. They can't go anymore. Young people can't go. Did you know you can never, that will never leave you the rest of your life. You can't, ba- you can't declare a bankruptcy for student loans. It's with you for life. The IRS will follow you to the grave. Avoid a consuming desire for prosperity, Paul told Timothy. Those who desire to be rich, and this is the whole, there are churches in this town that teach people you need to dream big. You need to want and, and, and ask God for this big stuff. Did you know that is a veiled form of what God says is dangerous. It's this health, wealth, prosperity, God wants you rich mentality that Christ and the apostles didn't know anything about. It's a modern invention. Actually, it's not modern because Jude talked about, and Peter, Second Peter talks about it too, but I mean, it's, it's an addition to the gospel, but it's been around from the beginning. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. See, the temptation is once you start getting riches, you want to protect it, you want to hoard it, you want to propagate it and, and multiply it and everything else, and into many foolish and harmful lusts. I mean, this guy that uh, recently exposed a, uh, you know, I don't even know all the sports players' names, but they're all taking this steroid cocktail thing so they can bulk up, and this guy in Miami, or I don't know where he was, was selling it to him, and the whole thing was exposed because of greed, because people were greedy, and, and it got out, and now all the players are going to be, um, you know, not allowed to play anymore. Poor guys, they only make a few hundred million dollars, you know, and I don't know what they'll do, but many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. I mean, money is, is, is such a snare. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Uh, for example, neglect of family. I got to work all the time. Why do you have to work all the time? Well, because we have to have a new car. So I'm going to get a second job to have a new car. And then we've got to remodel. And so I'm going to get a third job. So I do that. And what the Lord says, why don't you live in a house trailer and be happy and content and spend time with your family than working three jobs so you can have, you know what I mean? It's just, if we step back and think about it, nobody in their deathbed with the resuscitator on says, boy, I wish I would have spent more hours at work. What do they all say in the hospital rooms with tears? I wish I would have spent more time with you. You know, the people around you when you die are the people that really matter. Those who you should spend time with now too, right? And, and what the Lord says is all kinds of evils come from this drowning desire for more stuff, which some have strayed from the faith. Do you understand that believers were getting enmeshed in this, in their greediness, and they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Uh, they've left serving the Lord so that they can serve wealth and money. Here's another one, 1 Timothy 6, 11, but you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee what? Flee verse 10. Flee materialism, foolish and harmful lust, the temptation, the snare that, that desiring to be rich brings. Flee that. By the way, Timothy was pastoring one of the wealthiest churches of the ancient world, Ephesus. Ephesus only was rivaled by Rome. Ephesus was unbelievably wealthy. And so, Timothy was, was around people and he had to keep reminding them by his own choices to flee wealth and loving wealth and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Flee materialism and pursue those things. Here's the next one. The fifth one is uh, in verse 12 and 15 and 19. It, it 
repeatedly says the same thing. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession. Look at this. We can start living like this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm just in a tent. Heaven is home. Earth is camping. Have you ever gone camping? I mean real camping. I don't mean motorhoming. I mean camping where you get damp at night and you have to put newspaper under your sleeping bag, you know, because it absorbs the wet and, and it rains on you and everything is clammy and wet and you go out and you can't even start the fire and raccoons have gotten into your cooler. You know what I mean, camping, where you're all dirty and the kids are tracking dirt into the tent. That's what life is supposed to be like. Heaven, heaven is home. Eternal life is where we're headed. Life is camping. Did you know when you camp for a while, you can't wait to just roll it all up, shove it in the car and go home and put everything in the washing machine and dry everything and just get into a comfortable place with no sand, you know, and bugs and everything else. That's what life is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be a little bit uncomfortable here on earth. Remember, lust for comfort, lust for convenience, lust for security. And, and we pass up laying hold on eternal life because that's what we were called to and confess a good confession which he will manifest in his own time paul's now referring to christ he is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings and lord of lords who alone i mean look at this build up who alone has immortality dwells in unapproachable light that's where you're going that's what eternal life is no one is seen or can see to whom be honor and everlasting power amen now storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. He says either you're laying hold on material possessions or you're laying hold on eternal life. You can't have two masters. You can't have, no one can serve both. Cling to eternal life is the lesson. And there are two more, we hope. Um, sometimes I think I write on it too much and it doesn't like me. There we go. Pin your hopes on God. Command those who are rich. By the way, let's define rich. In, in the New Testament world, there were three levels of people. There were rich people. There were normal people, kind of like at the gas station, you know, premium, regular, unleaded, you know, poor. So it's just like life is like a gas station. There were three grades of people in Christ's time. Poor people only had, uh, I mean, did not have today's food. So they did not have today's food, like, like uh, no food for today. So because they didn't have any money to buy food or any food, they sat and begged. And you knew they were poor, they were destitute, they did not have any possessions, they did not have anything to get through that day, and they were poor. There were a few of those. Then there were normal people. Do you know what a normal person had? They had food for now. In other words, they had food at home. They had breakfast. Uh, they had food for their family that lived at home. And the man went out and worked. And he earned enough money to buy and bring home with him enough to put in the house so they would have breakfast and enough for them to eat. And most people back then that, that were normal people were laboring people that just kind of like our Americans today. 80% of America live from paycheck to paycheck. 70, high 70s, paycheck to paycheck. If they had one bump in the road, no savings to speak of. That is normal. They just, in the Bible, these people here were the ones who were normal. They just had enough. And this is the daily bread. Give us this day. What does it say in the Lord's Prayer? Our daily bread. This is normal people. Lord, help us to earn enough so we can make it through today. Rich had enough stored up for a while. They didn't have to go out and work today. In fact, they didn't even have to go out and work this week. And the richer they were, the further out they're, they're extent of their possessions were. This is where almost every one of us in this room are today. We have multiple of almost everything. 
We have multiple vehicles. We have multiple changes of clothes. We have food so much that we have to rotate it and throw some away because it expires, you know, and in the freezer and if the power goes out, you got to throw all that stuff away. And you know what I mean? It's just, we, by every standard, most of us tonight are rich. So the reason I said that is, if I can uh, go back, now come out without, oh, it's going to stay there. I thought I'd erase all that. But this is what I'm getting to. We're rich. So the Bible says, command. Now that's a, this is Pastor Timothy hearing from Apostle Paul. Command the people in the church who are not destitute, who are not only having today's food, but have more than they need for today, which I would say are about 99% of us in the congregation, the rich in this present age, not to be haughty. In other words, saying my stuff's better than your stuff. Not to trust in uncertain riches, thinking if I keep piling it up, no matter how much medical goes up, I want to be able to have the best care there is. Because that negates trusting in the living God. See, that's the problem of, of over trust in uncertain riches. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. And, and I added the constant concerns people have. I hope I have enough to, I hope that this investment will, I hope this job will last, whatever. The Lord, it is no surprise when we lose our job. It's no surprise when we lose anything, our health, anything. It's no surprise. The Lord says, pin your hopes on God and do what he asks you. And then the last principle, and we're going to have enough time to finish this. Verse 18 says, give until it hurts. Let them do good. Who's to them? Look at the, we're, we're one verse away. He said, command those who are rich. That's us. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works. And look what anybody that has more than they need for today is supposed to be. Ready to give, willing to share. We're supposed to be prowling around looking for ways to give away what we're entrusted with so that we get 10,000% interest in heaven. Did you know you get negative for keeping it on earth. You get 10,000 if you transfer it to God's ownership. And so you don't give everything away. That's the answer for the rich young ruler. You don't get rid of everything. That was for him to get saved, to see whether he was gonna obey the Lord. For us, we realize we are rich, but it belongs to the Lord. And so we go through life being rich in good works. Uh, looking for ways to, to use our resources for the kingdom, constantly looking for worthy ones to invest in and willing to share. I mean, if you find someone that has less than you, you're willing to share, you wanna give.